Coming up, we look back at 50 years of the American Indian Movement and the BIA takeover. We continue our coverage on Indigenous economics, plus hoop dancing for the next generation. I am Mackenzie Allen Charmley, filling in for Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach, and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Thank you for joining us. Aliyah Chavez is away. We begin in Arizona, where voters from the Navajo Nation will see familiar faces in the tribe's general election. Both Jonathan Nez and Boo Nigren are advancing in the nation's presidential race. Current President Nez and former vice presidential candidate Nigren received the most votes in Tuesday's primary. The two are divided on their approaches to the coronavirus pandemic. Nez's administration enacted some of the strictest measures in the country, and some are still in, the pl in place. And Nigren says that Navajo businesses are hurting because of those restrictions. Whoever wins will oversee the largest tribal territory in the U.S. and the second highest tribal population. A recent COVID-19 pandemic study shows a decline in lifespan for Native Americans. A report published last week by researchers Noreen Goldman and Teresa Andrus Fay shows a decrease in life expectancy for Native American people born during the COVID-19 pandemic. Their research is based on two separate data collections and shows there is an estimated loss in life duration at birth in 2020 and 2021. Age expectancy for those individuals have declined to approximately 67 and 65 years. The study also states that detrimental health-related behaviors adopted during the pandemic, such as smoking, drinking, and drug use becoming more frequent during this time, also plays a factor in the decrease. The research additionally discovered that the levels of life expectancy are far below those in every country in the Americas, with the sole exception of Haiti. Artifacts taken from the Wounded Knee site in South Dakota highlight the slow pace of repatriations. The items in a Massachusetts museum are believed to have been taken from ancestors massacred at Wounded Knee Creek in 1890. A federal database shows 870,000 items that should be returned to tribes by law. However, these artifacts are still in the possession of colleges, museums, and other institutions across the country. Shannon O'Laughlin, chief executive of the Association on American Indian Affairs, says after three decades of reports and studies, it's time to repatriate. Museum officials say though they've stepped up their efforts, federal repatriation regulations remain time-consuming and complicated. A prominent indigenous organization is aiming to find out the response of indigenous people on Pope Francis's apology last week. The National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition has a form on its website asking indigenous people about their reactions to the apology. The apology from Pope Francis came in late July and was given in Alberta at Musquachese. The questionnaire asks a number of questions, including whether you attended a boarding school or residential school, or if you are a descendant of someone who did. Well, our reviews are already in for the first two episodes of Reservation Dogs' second season. Many people in and outside of Indian Country have been waiting for the next episodes of the Peabody Award-winning comedy. The series follows Indigenous youth as they try to cope and heal after one of their friends commits suicide. In its review, the New York Times highlighted the deepened emotion and sense of place, and other write-ups point to the powerful writing and performances by an all-Native writer's room and star-studded cast. The series will release new episodes streaming on Hulu every Wednesday. And those are the headlines for the ICT newscast. Coming up, indigenous economics and hoop dancing. But first, we discuss the rise of the American Indian movement. Stay with us.
the 1970s ushered in a new era of American Indian history. The return of Blue Lake to the Taos Pueblo, the occupation of Alcatraz Island, and in 1972, the takeover of the BIA in Washington, D.C. The American Indian movement rose up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Today we meet Sid Bean, a Dakota man whose organizing efforts still live on today. Welcome, Sid. Amatakiapi. Hello, my relatives. Well, Sid, just to get started, you documented this history in 2008 in the film Native Nations, Standing Together for Civil Rights. Could you tell us more about that project? That project was based on 15 years of my life where I served as president of the National Indian Lutheran Board that was organized by the American Indian Movement in 1970. And that board became the largest funder of American Indian community organizing across the country uh, at that time, in which there weren't any casinos, the Indian Self-Determination Act haven't been implemented, so that there were little monies for tribes and urban groups to get to Washington and to testify on sovereignty issues. National Indian Lutheran Board filled that gap. And it was brought together initially by uh, Clyde Belcourt, Dennis Banks, uh, Charlie Deegan, uh, Floyd Wester, Red Crow Westerman, all of who I had a relationship through the boarding schools. There were several factors that came together 50 years ago and several different groups from, of people from different areas of the country to make a change. Um, some were at historical odds with each other. How do you think these actions have changed things for American Indians today? Those of us who had the opportunity to be there, to be mentored by those that came before us. I was originally mentored by Tilly Walker, a petite young woman from Medan, uh, who was uh, from uh, North Dakota, the three affiliated tribes. And she provided me money uh, for my education and later brought me into Washington, D.C., where I had opportunity to meet Mel Tom and Gus Adams and the leaders of the Red Power Movement at that time. So from there, I became involved in the Red Power Movement. And our actions ultimately, I think, affected legislation after and around the Indian Self-Determination Act, the Indian Religious Freedom Act, the uh, American Indian Policy Review Commission, which came on after the takeover of the BIA office in Washington. So there was great odds and differences between uh, those in Washington and those in the community that were pushing for change and self-determination and confrontation politics became our way to act. And people like Tilly Walker and Eugene Crawford and Vine Deloria, you know, all my mentors encouraged me to get involved at an early age in my 20s, and I stayed involved through my whole career. And so the film is about that, and my actions up to even today are working with those groups, including the American Indian Movement, who started the National Indian Lutheran Board, and allowed me and supported me to be the president for 15 years. Well, the Lutheran churches came together back then to support Native causes, and last week the Pope issued an apology in Canada for, uh, for the operations of residential schools. Can you reflect on the role Christianity has played on reservation and urban Indian communities? Well, I think that uh, the carryover here obviously is the boarding school issues. Uh, I'm very knowledgeable of that, having been raised in the boarding schools, actually lived in a boys' dormitory for many years. My parents were graduate of that boarding school and my grandparents of the mission schools. I'm very familiar with those issues. Uh, how they relate to us here, obviously, are very similarly. Uh, we have those same structures that, that uh, impeded upon our culture and our language. But also the other side of that is some of those churches like the Lutheran Church, the National Lutheran Board and the National Council of Churches uh, came to our support uh, through the Indian Civil Rights Movement, much as they did to the Black Civil Rights Movement. So we were sort of a parallel movement with strong support uh, in Washington, like from groups like the American Friends Committee, uh, the other churches who had 
offices in DC, we were able to uh, impact legislation working between tribes and urban groups coming together. And that and there was not very many instances where those two groups came together and worked together uh, with people like LaDonna Harris and Chuck Trimble and others who were in Washington and also understood the urban side as well as the reservation side. So we're still working today on those issues, but for us now, it's the doctrine of discovery. You know, the Pope has been called upon by at least five uh, denominations to rescind the doctrine of discovery. So until the Catholic Church, which, which recognized the right of, of Christians to take land from so-called savages where the indigenous people of this world is rescinded, we feel we still are not fully recognized. Well, Sid, we're wrapping up with our time here, but just to conclude, activism is something that is really important um, as a family value. Could you tell us some of the work you and your daughters have done in Minnesota? Yes, I continue as an organizer and activist, but I have a large family. I have four daughters here in Minnesota and now 13 grandchildren, so we're a force to be dealt with. We're also highly educated. You know, I'm an I'm a educator from uh, junior high through high school to college to university. I've taught all over the country, including at Arizona State University, which I'm an alumni of and received my graduate degree. But uh, within our family, we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have uh, psychologists, we have business people. So when we do research and what we're doing here in Minnesota and our family, and our Dakota people who were moved here and exiled in 1862. And therefore, most of us grew up in isolated reservations, removed from our homeland. So our work is about organizing now around stories and the stories of our people. The main one that we've received international recognition for is the changing of Lake Calhoun, who was named after John Calhoun, who as we know was the spark of the Civil War and the fighter of, and supporter of slavery throughout his whole career and drafted the American Indian Removal Act. And so to both Native Americans and African Americans, he was the ultimate uh, enemy. And so to have his name as the most popular name in Minneapolis was certainly uh, not in our best interest. And we see set out in over a 10 year period from 2008 to 2018, to get the name changed and to bring back the recognition of our Dakota village of Mapia Wakaskar or Cloudman that was on that lake. And through our efforts leading through getting support of the parks, the city, the county, ultimately the state, fighting through appeal by leading uh, uh, people who had a lot of money and you know, venture capitalists led the effort against us to not change the name, which it was also forced to, them to change their address to be named Kaska. Uh, we were able to take that appeal through the Minnesota Supreme Court and the National Geographic and Naming Commission approved it. And so it is in fact now uh, the name Kaska uh, by state and by national recognition. Well, thank you, Sid. Reporting about economics in Indigenous communities is something becoming more commonplace because of Mark Trehunt. He is ICT's lead correspondent on a special series called the Indigenous Economics Project. Mark joins us now for the latest in his series. Hi, Mark. Hi, good to see you, Mackenzie. It's good to see you too. So we just heard Sid Bean talk about the momentous events from 50 years ago. How does that set the stage of indigenous economies today? Well, first of all, I think its roots with Indian country today and ICT newscasts are really extraordinary. He mentioned the National Indian Lutheran Board. And one of the stories that not many people know is that the National Indian Lutheran Board was actually funding press in the 1970s. And so a lot of journalists were able to go to meetings and cover things because uh, Eugene Crawford would call them up and say, look, I've got some money I can help you get there. So that history is really part of our history too, which kicked into the economics project. Um, I also think that that era laid the groundwork for so much that's going on today. 
we think about Standing Rock and what a um, powerful moment that was, but it was similar with Alcatraz and some of the other things that happened during the 1970s where people saw the impact of a tribal community in ways they hadn't seen before. So you filed a story on corporate boards recently. At a high level, could you tell us what was found? Sure. Uh, if you look, there are some 4,000 boards, and I actually have another story coming on that. There are some 4,000 boards across the United States uh, representing uh, publicly traded companies, and American Indians and Alaska Natives are less than one-tenth of one percent. And there's a push to change that. There's a state law in California that requires board diversity, and also the NASDAQ, which is a big uh, trading regulatory uh, function, is also demanding that boards get more diverse. And what has been the reaction of your story on corporate boards? It's really interesting. There's a group on LinkedIn that's been running an entire thread. And this is folks who've gone to business schools, who have MBAs, who really have all of the kind of credentials that would be required to be on a board. And they're now using this as kind of a springboard to say, yeah, this is something we should be doing. And you think about a corporate board and it sounds like something far off, but one, it's a skill that we already have because we're doing it anyway. And second, it's a really good paying gig. Uh, most corporate boards pay an average of $300,000 a year. So you think about this being something that people have earned a right to do, it's really important. So based on your reporting, do you think representation on corporate boards is something that could be fixed fairly quickly? I don't know about quickly, but it is going to be fixed. I mean, if, if just the economics of it, a company that has a diverse board is going to be more in touch with the market. Uh, you'd have to go no further than the news industry. The news industry, we've, some of us have been saying, needs to be more diverse for really since the 1970s, and it hasn't done so, and the market share continues to decline. But that's because it lost its audience, and a diverse audience is the future. If there was a Native person who wanted to be a board member in training, what would they need to do to beef up their resume? Well, in the story, I profile Mary Smith, and she's a great example. She's been very diligent about going about being a corporate board member, what's required, reshaping her resume. For example, she was the director of the Indian Health Service, which is a government title. So she reprogrammed it in her resume to be chief executive officer of the Indian Health Service, which is a corporate title. So thinking through what it requires to be on a corporate board. I mean, of those 4,000 companies, remember each has about 12 board members. So that's a lot of seats and a lot of potential opportunity. And just to conclude our time here today, Mark, your project covers a lot about climate change. What stories do you have coming up the pipe? Well, a big one is the Senate is considering legislation right now on, uh, it's called the Inflation Reduction Act, but it's primarily a climate change bill. And it's really divided the environmental community. There's some good things in it that they like. But one big one that I'm writing about this week is carbon capture, which is taking uh, pollution and pumping it into the earth. It's kind of a crazy scheme, and it will cost taxpayers more than a billion dollars. So the question is, is it worth it? And finally, ICT's founder, Tim Gallego, passed away at the end of July. Could you tell our viewers just how big of a loss that was? Tim was extraordinary. Uh, Tim really had a vision for journalism uh, going back to the 1970s. And it's interesting that Tim and Richard LaCourse and some of the great um, journalists of that era really didn't want to mainstream journalism become more diverse. They wanted to have an ecosystem of just native journalism. And they worked really hard at that and built that up over their careers. I mean, our legacy at ICT is Tim Gallego. He really started the ball rolling and this is his uh, vision. Well, ICT's editor at large, Mark Trahan, thank you. Summer is typically when children have time to learn new skills. For a group in Phoenix, they can now add hoop dancing to that list. ICP's Aliyah Chavez and Max Montour recently learned about a new initiative aiming to teach culture and dance. Take a look. The sounds of the drumbeat in a ballet studio 
This is the scene on Wednesday nights at Ballet Arizona, the only professional ballet company in the state. Nine-year-old Shakea Torres takes ballet classes here. That's when she noticed none of the other dancers looked like her. This spurred her mom, Ginger Sykes Torres, to take action. Together with a handful of other Native parents, Ginger formed a tribal advisory council and convinced the ballet company to offer hoop dance classes for other Indigenous youth. It feels amazing that I'm dancing with like kids that like are like me. Being able to learn the dance here in the Ballet Arizona studios is just like a dream come true for like learning any dance, but something where you can have the mirrors, have the wide space, have the high ceilings. It's just not something that's easily found. Many urban Native children who grow up away from their communities aim to find ways to feel connected to their lifeways. That's the case of Rolena Morgan. She first learned about hoop dancing when stumbling upon it on TV. That prompted her and her brother to watch videos on YouTube and teach themselves. Then her mom found out about hoop dance classes and signed her up. She is the only in her family who is a hoop dancer. And it really helps when that you guys are doing more classes for this stuff because we have no one in our family that really does and teaches it and passes it down. Eva Bighorse is this year's instructor. She says the commitment is more than just teaching technique. It ends up developing into a cultural mentorship. It's, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. It's probably the best aspect of being the instructor is having the one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction with the kids. Um, and I think my favorite part is just being able to watch the students grow and learn. Um, a lot of times I get to see their excitement also grow with the classes uh, because I think it builds their confidence in themselves. And so the first class, they're usually really shy and kind of don't want to jump in there a whole lot. But um, with this class, especially both of them, I've noticed in both the beginning and intermediates, just just confidence and happiness. And that's my favorite aspect of teaching. Once we start sharing dance opportunities with them, um, we have to start talking about uh, regalia and how to dress appropriately. And so for a lot of these families, they this is first time for them. And the parents will come and ask me questions on, oh, what can my son or daughter wear? Um, what would be appropriate? Um, how should I fix their hoop? Um, so we've created, Ginger created an online tutorial on how to make the hoops. And we've learned that there's a big enough need for the next session that we're going to just dedicate an entire class to hoop making. Dance opportunities are more common than you might think. Phoenix is the home of the Hoop Dance World Championships, which are held every year at the Herd Museum. Since the classes started three years ago, some of the young dancers have already entered and placed. There's more female students in these classes than than male students. Um, and even at the herd competition, there's not a lot of female dancers when you get up to the adult categories. <laughs> and I know this because I'm one of them sometimes. <laughs> but it takes a lot, it takes a lot um, to dance this dance. So I think to see more females take it up and continue it throughout their life um, shows great strength. Ginger Sykes Torres was the class's first instructor. She was the first female to ever win a world championship title in hoop dancing. She said these kinds of dancing spaces are much different than what she had. Something that I didn't have as a youth, I'm sure most hoop dancers don't have this type of um, facility to learn in, but it is really key to being able to expedite that, that progress in, um, in learning the dance style. This is a long-term project for these instructors, all in hopes of helping Indigenous youth. And giving them something that can motivate them to stay healthy, stay active, stay engaged, and stay in touch with their own selves and their communities is just something that is so fulfilling and um, warms my heart and makes me want to keep um, providing this, this opportunity to, to our youth. In addition to hoop dancing, being exposed to ballet studios can also help in another way. The idea behind it that got me most excited was the mission of this program, which was to expose the hoop dance students 
to not only hoop dance, but other types of dance forms, um, including ballet. And in Indian country, you don't have to look very far for inspiration. To me, the links between Native American communities and the ballet community was something that was easy to find in our tribal nation's histories. The first prima ballerina in the United States was Maria Talchief, and so she is an inspiration to not only my daughter, but I'm sure many other Native American ballerinas across the nation. For Ballet Arizona leadership, they say they will continue helping along the journey. It's very important for us that we see representation in our company and in our school. And really how we begin that is by inviting the community to utilize our studios and have classes here so that they feel like this is a safe haven for them to explore their art form of dance. Hoop dance is something that we do wanna make sure that Ballet Arizona continues to host. It is our goal not just to offer these types of opportunities once. We want this to be part of our blood just like ballet is. In Phoenix, Arizona, Aliyah Chavez, ICT News. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.